Okay. Um, so thank you again for agreeing to do this. I know that you care a lot about early childhood issues. Um, so this should all be right up your alley. So first off, I want to start with like a big picture. At the federal level, there seems to be a lot more attention to pre-K and early care and access and affordability. And there seems to be um, a lot more resources that are coming with that. And so I'd love to hear from you how you would prioritize that, what parts of the system you would, for example, strengthen, which parts you would build out. When you look at education, uh, number one, the question we should be asking now uh, that we're receiving this uh, large contribution coming from the federal level to look at education, we must go at the, the root and look at the historical inequities. And it's, it's really mind boggling to me and is sort of personally um, hurtful uh, when I talk about early childhood education. You know, for many years, uh, I have, have experienced, experienced in learning disabilities and it wasn't until I got into college uh, that I started to just drill down on it. And then later in life, as actually the bar president, when I looked at our poor definition of early childhood development, uh, we think is from K through 12. And the neurologists and pediatricians are clear. Uh, it's the first thousand days of life. And that life is not when a baby is born, uh, that life is in a mother's womb. That's the first classroom. Uh, it's all about nutrition, it's about support, it's about ensuring that uh, she's receiving the information about brain development, and we just don't do that in poorer communities. So now it's an opportunity uh, to do just the opposite, to use these funds and closing the achievement gap, uh, not K through 12, but pregnancy through profession. And if we don't do that, we're setting children on a pathway of really um, having irreversible uh, learning disabilities and won't give them the opportunity to really be productive citizens. I say this over and over again. If you don't educate, you will incarcerate, and that's reflected in the incarceration rates you see uh, at even Rikers Island with 80% of the men and women that are incarcerated don't have a high school diploma, equivalency diploma. So I want to turn to affordability and access. Uh, the city has definitely made strides expanding pre-K, but affordable infant and toddler care can still be really hard to access um, and really expensive. There's a backlog of families waiting to receive vouchers to help pay for care. And at the same time, providers say that they have seats in their, in their centers that are going empty. So what is your understanding of where the problem lies there and how would you solve it? Well, it, it lies, the, the problems we're seeing about putting our babies and our children uh, in the seat uh, for uh, health care, for child care, I think it lies in two areas. Uh, number one, information. Uh, number two, uh, the failure to make it affordable and build out the spaces. So this is a great opportunity, as I mentioned in my UCARE, uh, my, my universal child care program, uh, we need to uh, prioritize space in city-owned buildings because that is one of the largest uh, costs uh, to um, having infant uh, care and toddler care is the cost of the space. Uh, we can utilize uh, office spaces in city buildings. We can rethink uh, the number of employees who are returning to work. Uh, there's a there's a large number of employees that could now do their work remotely. We need to be bold enough to move in that di direction. And then we need to look at those private owned business uh, buildings and give a density bonus to residential building owners uh, who are willing to uh, bring down, give permanently free or low rent to providers by giving them a tax tax brace, break in, in the process uh, in private owned businesses. And lastly, uh, we can look at our leases. Uh, I strongly believe based on the analysis of my team, we can save almost $250 million if we look at the leases uh, that we are uh, you know, really in contract with uh, throughout the entire city. Uh, we we are, are paying a premium price for expensive luxury locations when we can build this in the outer borough, have our office spaces, um, build out our outer borough, become anchor tenants to build up communities around. And that money that we save can go into a really ensuring we have a universal uh, infant and toddler, infant, uh, toddler care and child care at the same time. 
So when it comes specifically to the voucher issue, you think it's an education issue and that? Yes, yes, I do. And when I say educational issue, uh, it is communicated in the language and in the cultures that people receive information. We do a poor job in uh, communicating in the diverse languages, such as Chinese, you do, uh, all these different languages of our, of our city. Our failure to communicate in the multiple languages in this city is causing us to leave uh, too much on the table when it comes down to resources. We need to really re-empower uh, the census teams. Uh, these teams were uh, were made up of a coalition of nonprofit organizations and groups who communicated on the ground uh, to their various uh, ethnic and cultural groups. We should be using these teams year round to continually push out information. And there's no information that's more important to push out uh, than the information about access to child care, uh, access to infant and toddler, toddler care. We don't do a good enough job in doing that. Something else that a lot of working families struggle with is um, care for after the school day is over. Um, and that is in pre-K and child care as well as after school care and that sort of thing. So do you, and providers say, especially at the pre-K level that more extended day and extended school year slots are needed. I know you have thoughts about how long the school year should be, but do you think, especially in pre-K that universal, um, that there should be universal access to extended school day and school year care? Uh, you know, I'm a big believer in uh, utilizing our school buildings and other spaces uh, to have extended uh, chair, uh, care, child care, uh, even uh, for our uh, students uh, that are in high school, middle school, elementary school. And that's why I introduced as the borough president uh, something called the extended use program. Think about this for a moment. 7 a.m., we tell our babies, welcome to school. 3 p.m., <coughs> we stay, uh, get out and don't come back until tomorrow. These buildings, uh, they lay empty uh, from 3 p.m. until 7 a.m. the next day. That is unacceptable. Uh, my extended use plan opened the school buildings. We allocated $2 million and we opened the school buildings to allow of nonprofit local CBOs to use the space for free. Because when you, when you really think about the cost, rental of space, using space, that is really uh, some of the largest parts of actually having an overhead. So we were successful in doing so. I think we need to continue to expand this citywide uh, to allow our schools to be used, uh, not only uh, for uh, educational experiences, but also soft skills, communication, uh, 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 critical thinking, operating in groups, uh, dealing with uh, diversity, leaning into uh, educational experience by appreciating the diversity of our city. That's how we get to the roots of hate crime and financial literacy. All of these skills that our children need to continue, in, to continue the, the development of their brains and to learn those so, soft skills for the future. And we can do it by opening our schools. We have to properly manage our assets. Uh, and I think we're doing a terrible job in doing so and it's right in front of us. I wanna to turn to the workforce in early education. There have been strides um, in achieving something closer to pay parity for those teachers who are in childcare centers and pre-K centers um, in New York City. But there's still a lot of room to go. Uh, Pre-K special education teachers have largely been left out of the equation and there is not a plan uh, yet to catch up teachers who have been teaching in CBOs for a long time. So do you have a plan for reaching salary parity? And if so, what is your timeline in which you'd like to see that done? I, I believe salary parity is crucial um, for uh, these early childhood educators. You know, there's a level of hypocrisy when we talk about how important it is for our children uh, to have that early start in life. And I think part of the problem is we believe and we don't really respect the power of those early days. It's planting a seed. If that seed is not planted in the right soil, 
then it would actually uh, not turn into uh, the full plant that it should turn into. And nothing is more important than that seed development uh, than uh, those who are responsible uh, for shaping the brain and the minds of our children. And so I'm going to clearly invest in professional development for a new generation of early childhood educators and uh, studying from the best up-to-date brain science research. We spend a lot of time looking at what children learn and not how they learn. And I clearly support the call, uh, calls, especially from experts like Bank Street College in their pursuit of a, a living wage, wage as part of a shift toward pay and benefits parity. Uh, it is almost humiliating what we are paying of these professionals. And so we have to move in a level of increasing compensation through increasing the educational and credential uh, attainment. So let's incentivize of receiving more credentials, more experience, so that we would get uh, the true benefit of these early childhood years. Uh, we focus too much and believe it's only about K through 12. That is just not true. The research is clear. We now ha have to build our system around the research and not build it around what we have always done in the past, because that is going to continue to produce the failing product that we are seeing uh, day to day, year after year, uh, graduation after graduation. Do you have a time frame in which you think salary parity would be attainable? Well, we should all, and all of these additional, um, you know, additional PD, all of that. What's the time frame? Well, we should clearly, uh, when we look at the time frame of reaching pay parity, building out the infrastructure, uh, nothing is more exciting than now uh, because that we were able to uh, receive the monies from a long, hard fought battle. Of, of campaign for fiscal equity. Uh, the, ma the mayor is going to receive a substantial amount of money coming from uh, the uh, state, as well as, uh, as well as the monies we're going to receive from the federal government. So this is the opportunity to deal with the upfront cost that's associated with it. And once we deal with the upfront cost, we can ensure in the outer years that we will continue uh, to just stabilize what we're doing now. So I, I believe in the first one and two years, there should be a clear step process of ensuring the pay equity that we're looking for and a reinvestment in early childhood uh, development. Because as I state, stated, I use the term intentionally investment because uh, Archbishop Desmond Tutu states, we spend a lifetime pulling people out of the river. No one goes upstream and prevent them from falling in in the first place. If we don't go upstream and invest in our children, we're going to pay a higher cost in pulling them out of the river, the lack of education, the lack of employment, the lack of mental health services uh, downstream. So it's an investment to go upstream and it's a good investment for that upfront cost uh, before we uh, put our children on a pathway of not being a pro productive citizen, but individuals who need this society uh, to uh, carry them through. So I want to shift gears a little bit to after school programming and summer programming, uh, which are also crucial for working families. But providers say that every year they're caught in a budget dance where they have to advocate um, for the budget to do these things. And so would you commit to ending that? Uh, which programs would you like to see, if any, funded uh, on a longer term basis? A, a, a summer program and an after school program, to me, they both go together. Uh, the goal is uh, to really eradicate uh, the summer slide. Uh, we seem to ignore that uh, because the summer slide, for the most part, impacts uh, black and brown immigrant communities. When you go to affluent communities, uh, the entire summer uh, and even after school, uh, there are uh, clear programs that are laid out where the children are experiencing everything from the museums uh, to cultural institutions. You don't see that in poorer communities and immigrant communities. And so I'm focused on the summer slide. I've stated more than once, uh, we need to use uh, the summer months to expand summer school options. I believe we need to have a universal uh, tutorial program that's in place uh, where children and, and families can come together uh, to get the tutorial services that they need. And I also believe we need to use the summer months 
uh, to really help parents become more knowledgeable on how they help their children throughout the school school year. And so I think that our schools must uh, stay open year round and available for day long activities in so many different ways, not only to our students uh, who uh, we're focusing on an early learn, but also our continuing education, our children in the latter years as well. There needs to be a real support system uh, during the summer months. We underutilize our schools during the summer months, and we must ensure that we stop making it too difficult for our local CBOs uh, to do their jobs because we are delaying payments, making it too challenging uh, to receive your payments and jumping through too much, too, too many hoops to get the resources you need uh, to focus on our, our children. I'm going to have a person at City Hall that will be a clear liaison between our CBOs and all of our agencies to make sure that we can expedite and ensure that payments are on time, net 30 or almost next 60 uh, to ensure that our CBOs can do the job that we need them to do without worrying about reimbursements. So is that a yes to ending the so-called budget dance? Yeah, that is a two thumbs up yes. Okay. Um, so I want to zoom out now uh, looking ahead to the next school year and reopening. Um, the next mayor will uh, will be in charge sort of halfway through the next school year. But in your perfect world, in the meantime, what do you think the city needs to be doing now to build trust with families so that they return? We've seen, especially in pre-K, major dips in enrollment. It's down about 13% this year. And we've seen that families of color have been among the, the most reluctant to go back. So how do you turn that tide? Uh, uh, it is so important that we turn the tide to the low enrollments that we're seeing and just the lack of trust. And I call it the three C's, clarity, consistency, and communication. And we need to start that build out over the summer months. You don't wait until a week, two weeks uh, before school starts and then start informing parents and, of exactly what's taking place. Let's build out a real robust uh, communication system using everything from texting to phone calls to robocalls uh, to local stakeholders uh, to uh, websites that would give clear information on what to expect and up-to-date information. And then let's uh, use our local, uh, I like to call them credible messengers, uh, to uh, really get the information out to all of the diverse groups uh, in the city. And I use this over and over again, the lack of communicating to people in the manner in which they receive information and the language they receive information is one of the biggest inhibitors of, for our entire city uh, to get things done. And so we must have a robust uh, uh, communication network to ensure that our parents receive the clarity, the consistency, and the proper communication uh, throughout the year. Then we need to make sure we have strict compliance uh, with the robust, robust testing in place, strict compliance with face masks and social distance. Now that the CDC has stated three feet is a safe distance, we need to comply with that uh, to make sure that we don't have another spike in, in COVID. And lastly, we need to really invest in a robust uh, complete overhaul of the remote learning program, not using it as a foundation to learning, but to compensate uh, for our children uh, to help supplement the current learning system. We didn't do it this time. There's an art to remote learning, not only for the students, but also for the educators. So we need to show that we will have one of the best remote learning systems in this entire country.